Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. My name's Kira Parrott. I'm the director here at the library, and I'm really, really thrilled to be spending uh, this afternoon with all of you and our very special guest, Alice Look, uh, discussing women and celebrating women, remarkable women. Uh, it's especially resonant because we're in the middle of March, which, of course, is Women's History Month. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but Women's History Month, as we know it today, actually began as National Women's History Week. Uh, it started in the 1970s, and it was in 1980, I believe, that President Jimmy Carter uh, issued the first proclamation, making it an, an, uh, an official week. Is that a little better? Can you hear? Okay, getting a little closer there. Uh, so it was National Women's History Week from 1980 to about 1995, um, and I think it's a testament to the you know tenacity and spirit of women that we were like, thank you, but a week is not quite sufficient. We want and I think deserve a month, and so it was around 1995 that it eventually became the month that we know it today. Um, and ever since then, there's an organization called the National Women's History Alliance, and they are responsible for designating a theme every year for Women's History Month. And I looked it up. This year's theme is women who advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I thought that that was so appropriate and, and in such beautiful alignment with the work that our guest, Alice Look, has done for her entire career and certainly in this remarkable book. So Alice Look is a writer, a former journalist, and a television ex uh, production executive. Over her more than three decade career, she's been a news writer, a business reporter, and a documentary producer for news and entertainment networks. Uh, at A&E Television Networks, she managed an in-house production team that created episodic series, documentaries, and short form content for A&E, as well as the History Channel and Lifetime and other uh, channels that we know and love. Her first book here, Remarkable Women Reclaiming Their Stories, was released just this past January. And she also has two screenplays in development, Busy Lady, uh, and she lives here in Darien, Connecticut. Some of you may also know that Alice has a really special and strong connection here to Darien Library. Not only was she a former trustee of our board, but Alice served as the president of the board of trustees, and she got to work very closely with another really amazing, and I would say remarkable woman uh, by the name of Louise Parker Berry, who was the longtime beloved director of the library and one of my personal mentors. So feels kind of like a full circle moment, Alice. I really want to thank you for, for writing this book and for choosing to celebrate it here at the library with us today. Kira, it's really a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for offering the space, which is like a second home for me. Um, being the president of the Board of, uh, of Friends was really a special time, and it was during the centennial, actually. So we had a great year of programming, and there were a lot of remarkable people involved in that phase of the celebration as well. But um, so yes, the library has also been helpful to me in doing my research for some of the, the, the women in this book. So there's a lot that there's a lot going on here between the library and me, personally and professionally. I'd love to hear that. Uh, so we're going to have some fun today. I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, we're going to talk about the book and the project. And then we're going to have some fun with all of you in the audience as well and do some, some interactive yeah. uh, kind of questions and games. Uh, so I wanted to start with just how do you define a remarkable woman? What, what does that mean to you? That's a really good question, right? Um, I think, you know, we've... Um, so I want to backtrack a little bit, but the project really began as a television, a proposal for a television series. And so the book, usually when you, you see something on the, on the screen, it's like based on the book, right? Well, we did it the other way around. We had a television proposal and we were shopping it, but then uh, the pandemic hit and uh, nothing was happening. And then the strike came after that. Again, nothing was happening. So we decided that we weren't going to let the project just die. We wanted to keep moving it forward. And what better way than to create a weekly blog about a remarkable woman of the week. And then based on those blogs, we selected a bunch of women who we thought had really compelling stories to tell and illustrate what a remarkable woman is, right? So uh, I think we're, we're still, Jane and I are, are my collaborator over there. Raise your hand. <laughs> who are, we're involved in doing the television show. She's the editor of the book as well. She also has a similar background to me, a journalist, a writer, a filmmaker. But um, 
We talked about that a lot. Why, what is a remarkable woman? And I think at the end of all of this, we've got like 300 women that we're kind of looking into. They have uh, persistence, they have passion, they have courage, and they have conviction or what I like to believe is a belief in themselves, a self-belief that carries them through a lot of naysayers who say, you can't do that, we've never done that before, that's such a crazy idea. How, how many times have we each have heard that when we've had an idea, right? Whether it's you know, at home with our kids or our families or at work on the job. So they um, went through a lot of adversity, but I think those four qualities really are common throughout a lot of their stories, no matter what, what time, what era they lived in and what fields of endeavor they ended up pursuing. Um, they all were very brave and courageous and pr decided to listen to themselves, um, d despite what other people said, you know, took the noise out of their head. And that's a hard thing to do, right? It's very hard. <laughs> that's uh, keeping that tenacity, that resilience and, and persevering. Um, so can you, can you tell, tell us a little bit more about um, the origin story? And, and I understand we might have some uh, multimedia that we'll, that we'll dive in a little deeper as Right, well. right, right, yeah. So I'll, I'll set the stage for what we're gonna look at in a few minutes, which is a, a three minute trailer that was developed for our television mm -hmm. series as we're shopping it. And there's really actually two parts to the origin story. There's uh, always the truth, and then there are, there's a deeper truth behind it. So the, the, the truth behind the first origin story is that um, the idea for this I, uh, women behind, remarkable women who have been overlooked or not credited or dismissed or forgotten in history came out of a film that, that Jane was producing during the pandemic, which was about the six women behind the famous author James, jo James Joyce. And his pursuit of writing his masterpiece called Ulysses, which is more than 100 years old now. Um, so without these six women, there were two Americans, a British woman, uh, two French women, and um, his wife, right, Nora, <laughs> Irish, right? Yeah, okay. They um, supported him, they, they fed him, they enabled uh, his book to be published. They actually took the risk of publishing his book because Ulysses, when it was being written and excerpted, um, was considered obscene mm -hmm. and banned by the Supreme Court of the United States. You could not sell it, you could not um, buy it or read it, otherwise you risked uh, jail time and a fine. But these women uh, supported him and they risk their livelihood, they put their reputations on the line, and he got it published, right? So out of that movie, which Jane produced, we started talking, and she heard from a lot of other people about, well, there's a woman behind Alfred Einstein, there's a woman behind Mark Twain, there's a woman behind Richard Wagner, you know, the, they, were, they were wives, they were sisters, they were mothers, they were friends, they were supportive, and they were so helpful in getting each of these the men to achieve what they want achieve what they wanted to do, and so the more we talked about it, the more the concept grew. So it's not just the women behind famous men, but there are women who just um, have not been acknowledged. And we think in history that women have been sitting on the sidelines of big events. No, they haven't been sitting on the sidelines. They've been sidelined. Big difference, right? Because there were laws that didn't allow them to do any, some of the things they wanted to do, go to school, hold, run for office, you know, be lawyers even, pursue professions that were closed to them for a very long time. Um, so that's how this whole thing came about and the, the more we started digging, the more women we found. So that's one part of the story, but the other part, which is a lot shorter, is that, um, I have been researching uh, my mother's history for a long time, maybe 10, 15 years, and I got frustrated at a lot of points because I, I reached a lot of dead ends. I couldn't find any more information about her. First of all, she, um, she was born in China, mm -hmm. and I didn't read or write the language. I barely spoke the language, uh, so it was very hard to find documents, but there weren't many documents, and I was really baffled because 
on my father's side of the family, there was a lot of information, family trees, letters, um, records, so forth, on and on. And it occurred to me, the more I dug into it, it's because in a lot of societies, the patriarchal and all the information is held and passed on to the sons, to the males in the family. So the trail goes cold quite often for the women in these families. Um, so every time I dig into a story about a woman, there's, it has a resonance for me. And it, somehow it's, it helps in, a, in my own personal digging for my own mother's story to hear about these women that I really don't know, but I feel a connection somehow. So that's the two parts of the origin story. It's kind of long-winded, but. Uh, that is fascinating, and, and one of the things that was uh, that struck me reading this is is a little bit of I, I don't know if you'd call it shame, but you know not knowing so many of these names um, that you were able to to profile. But but we'd love to to see, see right. The so this is a trailer. It's, a, it's about a three minute trailer to tell us the concept behind the story. And there's some of the women in the trailer that are in the book, but we'll talk about them later. Yeah. That's really stirring. I mean, I don't know about you in the audience, but some, and some of the names I know, right? And, and a lot of them, you know, I was sad to say I, I didn't know. So I think we'd all love to hear a little bit more if you're willing to share about some of the women um, that really resonate for you, that really stick out in your mind. Uh, Jackie Cochran, uh, Katie Carrico, some of these amazing women that, that maybe of us, some of us have not grown up hearing stories about and didn't learn about in school. I think most of us haven't mm -hmm. heard most of these stories, so it's not surprising. Um, I was surprised. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so I uh, pulled out four stories of the women. So let me just uh, tell you who these women are on the cover of the book, because I didn't know who they were either. But anyway, so to at the top, um, the woman in pink, her name is Marion Croak. She is a uh, technologist an inventor and a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. She has a patent for something called uh, voiceover IP, which makes possible conference calls, Zoom, Skype. Mm -hmm. And she is now um, heading up the AI Institute at Google. But she's been working at all sorts of technological inventions all of her career. The woman next to her in the flight uh, aviator's uniform is Cornelia Port, who was the woman that I reference in the trailer, flying over Pearl Harbor when her plane was hit. Um, Katie Carrico, to, uh, to, on the third column there, is the uh, woman, the biochemist, who was born in Hungary and came to this country with $1,200 sewn into her child's teddy bear to start her career because she couldn't find funding in her home country of Hungary to pursue her research into mRNA. This was many, many years ago in the 80s. So um, took 35 years for her to really find um, the sweet spot and, and come up with the patent for that. So that was 10 years actually before the, the pandemic began. So it was, the vaccine was tested, it was trialed, it was you know gone through all the rigorous procedures that it had to do and it was ready when the pandemic broke. So, and then in the last column there, the woman with the flowers, that's Jeanette uh, Rankin, who we'll talk about a little bit later. She's the first Congresswoman. Mm -hmm. On the second row, uh, the African-American woman on the far left is Bessie Coleman. She is the first African-American and Native American woman to hold a pilot's license in the United States. Mm -hmm. Next to her is Anne Lowe, the woman, the fashion designer for Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress. Um, and next to her with the big uh, garden hat is Anne Axtell Morris, a pioneering archeologist. And on the last uh, row, uh, last block over there, that's Ada Lovelace, who is considered the world's first computer programmer. Right. So the last row, my favorite picture right here on the left, the woman with the cigarette, I know not correct, <laughs> but Look at the look on her face, right? Like that is Martha Gellhorn, who is a war correspondent, was a war correspondent, and she was the only woman on the beach in Normandy on D-Day. Yeah. So next to her is Opal Lee. She is called the grandmother of Juneteenth. Juneteenth, the holiday. Juneteenth. Opal Lee, <laughs> sorry, Opal Lee in the red shirt is called the grandmother of Juneteenth, the holiday we now celebrate on June 19th. Um, next to her is Anne 
Jarvis, who is the woman who is credited with starting Mother's Day. And in the last block over there, that's Barbara Giddings. She is a pioneer in the LBGTQ movement. So, so it's just a sampling of the women that we've been profiling. But um, the rest of the, the PowerPoint, we can get into four women that I selected, who I thought were really, really interesting women. So Jeanette Rankin was the first congresswoman. She was a Republican from the state of Montana. Um, and she got elected on two issues. Actually, two issues defined her career. The first issue was women's suffrage, which got her elected. And then the second issue was pacifism, which killed her political career. So it's interesting that she won election. She served two terms in Congress. The first time was in 1916 when she won the election. She got sworn in in 1917. And on her first day on the job, two big things happened. She got on the floor of Congress, and she read the proposal for the language that would become the 19th Amendment, which guarantees women the right to the vote. So keep in mind, she got elected before women had the right to vote. And how did she get elected, right? Women were able to vote on a statewide basis in some states in the western part of the country because um, the West was the last part of the United States that was populated. And the states wanted more people to move there, so they wanted to make it as enticing as possible. Families, you know, with children and wives and so forth. So they, they, they pushed to have women's suffrage available to them on a statewide basis. So Jeanette Rankin actually worked for the suffrage, women's suffrage movement for about 15 years before she decided she wanted to run for office. And she won. But anyway, um, so she proposed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment on the floor of the Congress on her first day in the job. And then later that day, the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, called a special session of Congress. And he requested that Congress vote for the, um, for the, for the country, to take the country into World War I. So this was 1917. There was yet another year left to, to World War I. Um, and it was really first crucial. First day of the job. <laughs> I know, that's a, that's a pretty big first day, right? There's no orientation here. There's no, no, no honeymoon here, here, right? Right into the fire. Um, so Jeanette was a pacifist, as I said, right? So she raised her hand and she said, no, I do not approve of taking the country into war. She wasn't the only one. There were 49 other men who voted no as well. But it was her vote that really created the backlash. The suffrages, uh, suffrage, some of the people in the suffrage movements didn't agree with her. They said, you've got to vote yes, because we have to dispel the notion that women do not have the spine to go to war. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, she was already splitting her support among so many different groups. It was really a tough position for her to be in. But anyway, uh, the vote really cost her because when her term came up, it's only two years, right? It goes by like this. She lost a re-election, and she decided to drop out. And she devoted the next two decades to working for um, the peace process. You know, she would attend international conferences uh, on peace. She would speak out on the, on the topic. She would start organizations. But 25 years later, um, we're now in 1940, and there's another war going on uh, in Europe and in Asia, and she decides that she wants to have give peace a chance at the table, right? So she decides, she makes a really hard decision. I'm gonna run again, she said. So she decided to campaign, and she won again as Congresswoman from Montana. And um, everything was fine. She said, it's not a big deal now for women to serve in office. There are several women, and that was true. Oh, about a month, a year later, it's 1941, and it's December, and um, Pearl Harbor gets attacked, and President Roosevelt calls uh, a special se session of Congress. It's like a nightmare all over again, Here's right? Again. <laughs> right. Timing is everything, they say, right? So, but this time, uh, the backlash is much worse. She's the only person who votes no. And um, when, she's, when the, the session is over, she is mobbed on the, on the floor of the Capitol. And 
it's so bad that she has to hide in a phone booth. She can't even get to her office. And the security on the Capitol have to escort her from the phone booth to, it's not funny actually, it's really serious. There was no support for um, a no vote. So again, her political career is derailed and um, she, dr she doesn't run again for office. And I can't she, blame her. <laughs> yeah. And she decides to just rededicate her efforts to pacifism. Yeah, you can see that's her, that is a, that's some of her campaign um, flyer literature for when the first time she ran for office. And then you see her working, um, uh, I forget what event this is, but a rally of some sort. Uh, I think this was before the Second World War. And then uh, after the, the no vote for uh, in December 1941, that was typical of the kind of press that she got. Yeah. But her story doesn't end there. You know, uh, 20, another 20 years later, it's 1968, and guess what? We're in another war, <laughs> Vietnam, right? She rallies 5,000 women to form the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, and they march in Washington. And there she is in the middle. I don't know if you can see her that well, but she's right over the V in Vietnam. She, at that point, she was about, she was in her 70s. Yeah. A woman who stuck to her principles. Uh, yeah. Despite right. all of that. So courage, <laughs> persistence, of, passion, yeah, conviction, right. right? Yeah. She had an amazing story. Um, she, and uh, she died in, I think it was 1973, so she didn't get to see the end of the war, but she was reportedly considering another run for office. <laughs> <laughs> Never give up. Right. Okay, so then we have Anne Lowe, who um, also has a different but an incredible story. She grew up in Montgomery, Alabama from um, a family of seamstresses, her mother and grandmother, and her, they taught her how to sew. She started working when she was 16 because her mother died, and at the time she had a little business, and it was New Year's Eve, and, well, it was New Year, it was Christmas time, mm -hmm. and she had four dresses that she had to deliver, but she hadn't finished them. So Anne had to finish them. And one of them was for the wife of the governor of Alabama. So again, into the fire, right? <laughs> There's no honeymoon here. Um, so she knew that she wanted to pursue dressmaking as a business, but she didn't have the skills. So she decided that she really needed to go to school. So she applied to um, a pretty well-known um, dress designing school in New York City. She got it applied, she got accepted, she arrived. And when she arrived, the director said, you need to go home. She said, first of all, you're black, and the other students will not sit in the same classroom with you. So she prevailed upon him and she said, look, I'll take, the I'll take the classes, I'll sit in a classroom by myself, basically segregating herself, and I'll, I paid for these classes, so please let me stay, and, and he did. And she finished the class ahead of all the other students. And she went home and she uh, continued to build her business. She was now living in Tampa, Florida. Uh, 10 years later, she, um, she decides that Tampa's too small for her, she really has much bigger ambitions than this, right? And her ambition is to go to New York City and open a salon, which is uh, what she did. She managed to save, I think it's $20,000. This is 1928. $20,000 is worth $350,000 today, I think. I'm not sure. But so she thought she had enough savings to go to New York City and start all over again. But, you know, New York is not Tampa. She had to start over and build new clients, a whole new clientele. And it was 1928. So what happened in 1929? Ouch. <laughs> Stock market crash. Bad timing. <laughs> depression. Nobody is buying ball gowns. Nobody's going to proms or dances or any of that stuff, right? So she ran out of savings and she had to hire herself out as a freelance dress designer. She worked for big, big fashion houses and she worked for places like Saks Fifth Avenue, Hattie Carnegie, um, so forth. That's where she met some of the really high society women who would become so important to 
backing her and supporting her later on when she got enough money and experience to break out on her own again. She never lost her dream of being a big time fashion designer in the heart of the fashion world, right? Um, so one of the women who was one of her biggest supporters was um, Janet Bouvier, who was a society uh, so socialite who came from a, a lot of wealth and old money and so forth. Um, Janet was getting married again for a second time. Her first husband had died. She was getting married to Hugh Auchengloss, who was the heir to Standard Oil. We've heard of Standard Oil, right? Yeah. Um, so she said to um, Anne, I love your work. You need to make my wedding dress. And she did. And it was a big hit. Um, 10 years later, Janet's daughter <laughs> is part of one half of the it couple of, 19, of the 1950s. She's engaged to John Kennedy, a former war hero, also a old, old wealth family, a very a power couple, you know. And Janet said, you have to make Jacqueline's wedding dress, right? And so Anne Lowe knew that this was it. This was her ambition come true. This was her dream job, right? And she said, yes, of course, right? Not only was she going to make Jackie's dress, but the entire, the dresses for all time, 10 bridesmaids. It's huge, right? But uh, two weeks, be everything was going fine. But then two weeks before the wedding, it was a, a, a fall wedding, she was in her salon, and she walked, came in one morning, and the pipes had burst. So everything was ruined. She had to order the material all over again, start all over again, and it was, a, it was a financial loss for her because she never told Janet, you know, look, there was an accident and everything was destroyed, so we have to, you have to, you know, help me here, right? She ate all the costs, and then she got it done, and she took the dresses on a train to Newport. She got to the mansion, she knocked on the door, and the butler opened the door and said, who are you? And she said, I'm here with the wedding dresses. And he said, go back to the back of the house. You can't come in through the front. <laughs> there was no end to the, you know, to the obstacles that she was facing here. And she said, if I can't come in through the front door, I'm going home. So she came in through the front door. The wedding took place. It was uh, the, the wedding of the season, right? However, it was covered in every newspaper, it was on the front page of the New York Times, but the only newspaper that credited Ann Lowe as a designer of the dress was one newspaper, the Washington Post. So she never got the credit, she never got the glory, she never got the financial benefit of being associated with such a prominent wedding, um, which was terrible because she was herself not a great businesswoman. She could have really profited and lived comfortably probably for the rest of her life. So that was um, uh, unfortunate for Anne, but you see how her dress is, um, this is not uh, Jackie's dress, but a lot of her designs are in the Smithsonian Museum of African American Culture and History today. Uh, and they're lovely, they're really beautiful. She had a really exquisite style, and even though Jackie said she really didn't like the dress, <laughs> Stunning, how could you not like it? <laughs> she said it was like a big lampshade, she oh. thought. <laughs> but anyway, so the end of the story is that after she made Jackie's dress, she continued to sew and so forth. But as I said, she wasn't a great businessman, a uh, business person. Um, she ended up bankrupt and she was losing her eyesight at the end of her life. Um, uh, she owed the IRS $13,000 in back taxes and she wasn't able to pay it because she was recovering from um, eye surgery and she couldn't work. But an anonymous friend, which we think the story goes, is Jacqueline Kennedy paid the tax bill for her. So there was some justice in the world, right? Okay. Okay, so we have two Who else more. Do we have, oh. Yes. So this is a really great story because there's a Darianne connection here, mm -hmm. which I'll tell you about later. <laughs> but anyway. Anne Axtell Morris um, knew what she wanted to be when the time, from the time she was a child. The family story goes that they, when she was six years old, somebody said to her, so Anne, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, let me see, she said, 
I want to dig for buried treasure, explore among the Indians, paint pictures, wear a gun, and go to college. So that's an archaeologist, right? She didn't know the word for it, right? She wanted to be Indiana Jones. <laughs> well, yeah, she actually ended up marrying an archaeologist named Earl Morris, who was supposedly the uh, template for um, Indiana Indian. Jones. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't really know if that's true or not. But anyway, she went to um, Smith College, and she studied history. But she really wasn't satisfied with the courses that she was receiving there. She, she didn't think the history was old enough. She really wanted something much more prehistoric and so forth. And the history professors told her, you really don't want history. You want archaeology. So she, uh, after she graduated, she went to France and she enrolled in an archaeology school where she learned uh, all about excavation, lab techniques, um, you know, all the things that you need to know in order to work in the field and so forth. And she came home and she met Earl Morris. He was actually one of her heroes. Uh, and they, he was 10, 12 years older, but they fell in love. And it was sort of like a perfect marriage, right? The, you know, your partner loves what you want to love and you want to do the same thing together. And they were so crazy about what they wanted to do that on their honeymoon, they took their honeymoon. Now, people go to Paris, they go to like <laughs> Bali, whatever. They went to a place in Arizona called the Mummy Cave and the Canyon del Morte, which is the Canyon of Death. Oh, romantic. <laughs> exactly. But they didn't care. They were doing what they wanted to do. Uh, that's how much how passionate they both were about it. So um, there was a lot of uh, uh, opposition to um, Anne being on some of these digs. Uh, this is a famous one in Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. So her husband is the one with the dark hat and the mustache. Um, and the, the guy on the other side with that Pecos Bill hat, you know, like, uh, he was, a, he was, his name was, um, I forget what his name was, I, I, I think it's Savannah Moore or something like that. But when she showed up, he said to her, oh my gosh, thank gosh you're here, you know, now you can babysit my six-year-old and you can be the hostess for the project, right? <laughs> So that was the, that was a common uh, role for women on these sites back then, but she persisted. She stuck with her husband. She was actually really grateful that he was like her entree into actually real field work. So while he was out there excavating and bringing up relics and just making all these discoveries, uh, she was she got out her um, her her watercolor pad and started sketching what he was able to uncover. And her contribution was before she, she started reproducing what she saw on the cave walls, most archaeologists had pen and pencil, pen and ink, you know, and they just drew what they saw and you could get sort of like a sketch of what was going on. She decided that it was really important to duplicate as much as possible what, they, what the colors were like, what, it brought everything to life. So uh, years later, when the National Park Service began developing standards for how archaeologists, archaeologists should work in the field, they used a lot of what she began as the basis for creating rules and policies. So her, her contribution to archaeologists was not only being an inspiration to other women to go into the field, but also really uh, solid research. Setting these standards. Yeah. Kirsten Neuschaefer, right. So she's still alive, <laughs> and she has an incredible story. She's an athlete uh, from South Africa, and um, she, uh, she entered um, something called the Global, Golden Globe uh, Race in 2022. She had spent two and a half years preparing for it. This was her first race ever. She was 38 years old at the time. And she was an experienced sailor. She had skippered solo trips delivering boats from the boatyards to clients all over the world. She had chartered uh, trips for tourists into the Arctic, the Antarctic, Falklands, uh, Patagonia. She knew how to, to sail a boat, but to do it solo around the world. And there were also, it was a retro race, so it's not like you get the best boat, you get the fastest boat with the latest technology. It's the opposite. 
the 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 glow the Golden Globe race is really an homage to a race that was started in in the 1960s. So in order to enter, you can't have a boat that's um, old that's more recent than 1988. You can't have you can't have satellite. You can't have GPS. Uh, you can't have radar. You definitely can't have, can't have any sort of technological device to communicate with either another sailor or somebody back on the land or anything like that. What you could have is a manual wind-up clock. You could have, you could have um, a, a ship-to-shore radio. You could have a cassette player with cassette tapes. The whole idea is that you have to be an excellent uh, sailor and you have to de depend on your intuition and your, your smarts. Um, so this was her first race. And she came in first after nine months alone at sea. Right, and it was, nobody expected her to do that. She was only the second woman to ever enter that race. So, and this happened last year. She, she took off from France in September of 2022 and she sailed back into France Harbor um, in April. To me, that's like the beginning of like a horror story, but I mean, good for her. That's incredible. So yeah, the, these, uh, you know, incredible journey, right? It's, it's amazing. And, and like I said, so many of these, these names um, I didn't know or, or, you know, hadn't heard before or, or a little bit, you know, like Jeanette Rankin, you may have heard that, Women's History Month, but didn't understand, um, you know, the full, the full journey um, and all of the obstacles um, that these women had to overcome. Um, before we open up to the audience, what was the Darianne connection with Anne oh, Morris? Oh, right, okay, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm dying to know. <laughs> so, um, Anne Extel Morris is the great, great aunt of, I'm sorry, her great, her great niece lives here in Darianne, and she's a, a friend of mine. And she didn't even know she was related to her until I gave her the book, and she opened it, and she was flipping through it, and she said, Axtell, that's my mother's family name, you know, and there are not too many Axtells. And so that started her on a journey. She asked her sister to do some research. Her sister is a medical librarian, and, and uh, uh, weeks later, I said, Pam, what happened? You know, what's, <laughs> are you related or are you not related? And she said that her sister found that there were books in her mother's library that, that you know, are credited to Anne. Oh, so I was like amazed that. <laughs> Love that. Um, so let's open it up uh, to our friends out here in the audience. So I know some of you, when you walked in, you, you got a little card, a little index card. So on the card, it might be the name of a remarkable woman who's profiled in the book. It might be a famous quote or a little piece of trivia or a question. So we thought we would sort of open up the Q&A with you. So if you have your own question, you can certainly ask Alice a question of your own. But if you don't, you can sort of hold out, you can read out your card and you know, we'll kind of play a little bit with it. I think for, for most of the, the, there was a lot of, there were a lot of setbacks for most of these women, you know. Um, and it's, it's, it's similar to any story. It, it's up and down, you know, there are conflicts, there's drama, there's, high periods and low periods. Uh, what, why I chose these women, I, I really don't know. I mean, they just struck me when I was researching them that some of these women were just, I was astonished at what they were able to accomplish and pr how, how, how long they were able to persevere in their pursuit of what they wanted to do and believed in. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many stories I've started to write and then I, don't, and I never finish them or our projects, right? But they kept at it. And I think that's really one of the qualities that really struck me about some of these women, that they, it was just so amazing that they felt so strongly about an idea or a concept or an invention. They just kept at it and at it and at it until they got as far as they could. <laughs> the Witch of Wall Street. So her name was Hetty Green. And she was either a, a witch or a genius, depending on what side, how, how you thought of her. She was from a New Bedford family back in um, the early 1900s. New Bedford was, at one time, a very prosperous town because that was where um, whaling oil 
was developed and processed, and that, that was the main form of energy at the time you know, before electricity and coal and all that kind of stuff, right? So she inherited a, a ton of money, and money was everything to her. She was a really sharp businesswoman. She learned how to negotiate, how to purchase and, and work with merchants and all sorts of sailors and, and, and businesses. Um, and she was so successful she, that she was able to loan New York City money when they were in financial crises. You know, she was in the same level as J.P. Morgan, uh, Jay Gould, th that era. Um, so some people thought she was a genius, but the people who didn't like her called her a witch because women just were not business women. You know, and if you were out of the ordinary, you were set up to be called names. So. Right, who's writing the stories, right? right. Exactly. Um, I really w wish that somehow this could be part of like curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, How do we change it? Right, because yeah, you and I sharing this is great, but the next generation and the generation after that, the perception of, of how history was put together, how our, wor how our world came together in our society is shaped by not just one section of the population. It's, it, it, and the whole idea of International Women's Day, inspire inclusion, that's what this is really about. You know, we're, We need to tell the complete story of history and historical events. So I would really love that somehow this becomes an educational project as well. Absolutely, and, and certainly during March, but not just during March, right? Like all year long as, as part of the, the fundamental history education. Yeah. yeah. The question was who invented the bra for those Carice in the back? Carice Crosby. She got the patent for the bra in 1914, and the invention was made out of silk handkerchiefs, ribbons, and pins. Up to then, people, uh, women wore corsets, which as everybody knows, probably is not very comfortable, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, she sold the patent for $1,500 to what's today the Warner Company. <laughs> volume two? Are we thinking of volume two, volume three? <laughs> we are thinking of putting an, uh, out another edition because there's just so many more stories. Um, part of it is also uh, we're developing this also as a television show. So some of the research was further along on some stories than others. And also we, there's a lot of photographs. We had to clear you know, photographs, uh, license them, and so forth. So there was a lot of different reasons. Um, that doesn't mean that the other 200 and so are not remarkable and worthy of a story, but these just bubbled up to the top for all those reasons. <laughs> PBS, that's an interesting one. Yeah, um, PBS is an interesting, it, they would seem like they had, they'd be like a, a natural, right? And there, uh, t uh, what is it, three or four years ago, there was a series called, um, Unladylike, right, which, is, which was for the 2020 um, celebration of the 19th, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, right? It was a series of shorts about remarkable women. So uh, they, they decided not to continue after that. So PBS has been approached by another uh, producer to do something like that, but they've passed on it, so. Um, I wrote about Jeannie Levitt. I don't know if you know about her. She was the first uh, female uh, Air Force fighter pilot. Um, she became a, a two-star general eventually. Um, but uh, but all, a lot of the aviators, there are a lot of aviators in my research. Bessie Coleman, Cornelia Ford, um, Nancy Love. They were involved in, uh, 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 aviation was a really hot thing in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and women wanted to be in on it. So there was a lot of women who w were wanted to, to do more than just uh, fly. They wanted actually to serve in the war, but that would take so many more years, you know, more decades later before that could happen. But there is, like, there's, there's a whole, I mean, I have the database I can show you at some point, but it's, like, all categorized into, like, aviators, scientists, inventors, math geniuses, you know, writers, and so forth. And there's a great chunk of um, women pilots and aviators. And that's remarkablewomenstories.com, right? There's so many ways that we can go deep into this subject, you know, by profession, by time, by state, by, you know, all sorts of ways. Yeah, it's, it's really an endless kind of, you know, uh, category. 
Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, I mean that's the whole point. We we don't. I really don't. I just wish I knew her. I, yeah, the point of the book is not to, to do the, the definitive authorized biography profile of a particular woman. It's really to set this woman's um, story in context of her time. And also, yeah, you're absolutely right. You just skip around and choose whatever you want to read. It's not a big commitment. And it, it, should, it should spark kind of ideas about like, well, what else is out there, you know? So you can be a marketer. <laughs> I was going to say that is a perfect segue to sort of uh, wrap up our conversation because um, I was going to say this I think makes a wonderful gift. It could make a wonderful Mother's Day gift to your daughter, to your granddaughters, I think, uh, and men too because these are stories that um, right. we obviously all we all embrace them. as women, but, but men and young boys I think uh, deserve to embrace them too. They're just fascinating history. They're really interesting. Like you said, you wanted, you wanted to know her. Like so many of the women I read about in your book, I'm like, ah. Oh, I want to get coffee with this gal. Like this is this is just amazing, amazing uh, people profiled. So, uh, thank you, Alice. Thank you for for the, the amazing research. I, the librarian in me wants to like dig into that spreadsheet of yours. That sounds fascinating. Um, and thank you for sharing their stories. And thank you all for spending your uh, Sunday afternoon thank you. with us.